college or regular college? Regular college is how you should uh, uh, look at it. But if you have personal feelings about things, you're certainly welcome to share. That's just who you are, you know? Yeah. Well, my whole journey has been kind of a combination of art and spirituality. So, so that it sort of flows into my work, but I don't like to, you know, babble about too much of that stuff if folks are just wanting to hear about the nuts and bolts of writing. So just trying to gauge. So I'll just, I'll just tell things that are appropriate to the journey. But, but I just was always a guy that liked to put on a show. That was my, my gig was I liked putting on a show. And um, it just, it made, it just, it was just part of who I am. I think that's a genetic thing that happens to people uh, to get into show business usually. And um, from the time I was a little kid, I was always out in front of the group. I was a class clown. I was just, you know, we put on shows in the neighborhood to raise money for the Humane Society. It was just an excuse so people would come because if we would just put on a show for us, people thought it was uh, silly. And then um, what happened, I asked a guy, and I anomaly had a, a kind of a thirst for something more spiritual, and I got involved in the church. Uh, I went to Presbyterian Church for about 15 years, and... Um, and there I got really involved in youth work and wanted to do, uh, so I was doing media for the church and media for missionary groups, and that kind of thing. And uh, someone said I should go to film school so I could get better at that. And I went to USC's film school and um, wrote a little religious action adventure comedy film. And that film got, uh, got some attention, won some awards, screened at the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. And- Was that and, fat? Um, was that was that Fat, fat Dancing? Dancing? The Man in the Fat You know, that's online. I can send you a link and you guys can watch that if you want. Yes. Uh, kill, kill 20 minutes. Um, so <laughs> so um, then uh, that got me an agent. Agent said, look, I can't sell a little Christian action adventure comedy film, a short Christian thing. So I said, great. So I wrote a long Christian action adventure comedy film, which nobody <laughs> wanted to read. And um, except this guy came in from Utah, um, Doug Stewart, who was looking to write a Mormon action adventure comedy film. And uh, he, he, he couldn't afford the writer he wanted, but the agency had me. And um, so we, we kind of tussled because I didn't want to write a Mormon film. And uh, we agreed on sort of a Judeo-Christian action adventure comedy film. And, uh, and that, nobody wanted to touch that either. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so then, but that guy knew Don Bluth uh, in Ireland, which is where Ken was working. And he sent the script to, to, to the company uh, to see if Don would be interested in financing a live action, crazy Jewish Christian action adventure comedy film. And Don was not interested in that, but he liked the writing. But actually, I think Ken liked the writing is what happened, right? You and, 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 and my buddy David Steinberg. A couple of young guys working in the studio, just kind of doing what needed to be done to help keep the studio going. And, um, and one of their jobs, I think, was reading scripts. So That's they right. read my little script and thought it was funny, and they gave it to Don, and Don liked it. And, um, and I got hired. I went over there for two weeks uh, to, to do a rewrite on what became All Dogs Go to Heaven. And that's what started my career. And then you have to start your career after every project, unless you're a superstar, um, which on paper, when people meet me, if they look at this, the superstars are the guys that the studios are waiting in line for them to become free. Uh, and these are guys who usually write original projects that blow people away. Uh, I'm a craftsman, and I'm, I'm pretty good at it over the last 25, almost 30 years. Um, I've gotten to where I can help a studio um, craft a property they have into something that you can sell tickets to. Uh, so I'm, I'm good at that, but it's not like the studios are like, when's Weiss going to be available? Uh, so... <laughs> So uh, I'm always having to hustle and sell the next thing. And you go for sometimes long periods of time where you don't know if that next thing's going to happen. And I, you know, my wife, if you ask her, she'll say, she's always believed in me, bless her heart. But if you ask her, she'll say, I've, I've thought my career was ending for the last 25 years. Um, <laughs> and a buddy of mine, we, we sort of joke, I'll say, look, when I look back, there's 25 years of beautiful railroad track through the wilderness. And uh, when I look ahead, I can see about eight feet of track, and I'm going 60 miles an hour. <laughs> so it's always like, oh, no, what's going to happen next? That's <laughs> uh, sort of the life of, of, of most writers. Um, I'm not average, and my writing partner and I are in the upper echelons. We're probably, you know, the, the low A- minus team, the high B-plus team, you know. But uh, then there's your elite crew, the Steve Zalians and the Aaron Sorkins and the, you know, that, that gang of guys. Let me just shut off my air conditioning because that's – um, is that loud for you guys? Can you hear that hum? 
We can't hear it. You're okay. I'll leave it on. I can stay cool. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the career of it all. Um, you guys probably have seen my the IMDb or Ken probably showed you the credits or whatever. Do I, I don't need to run through that, do I? My yeah, comments. they've got your resume, so they, they, they know those So and right now, thank God we're working on Enchanted 2 for Disney, which is really a great project to be on. Um, so the second draft is going into the studio president. It'll be the first time he's seen it. We've been working on it for a year. So uh, the executives are all very excited about it, and hopefully that'll go well. We should, if, uh, if all goes as, as uh, we would hope, he'll see it on uh, this weekend. So that's what we're up to. So um, any questions so far? I, I had one just, I, I thought it was very interesting that you've been working on this project at Chanda 2 for a year. Yeah. And I think that would be a surprise to most. A year? Could you elaborate on that? I mean, yeah. that, that, that sounds um, like a long time, but it's not really, is it? Well, you have to pace yourself because otherwise you'd go insane. That's one of the things that's good about being a, a more mature writer is I'm just, you just, you really have to enjoy your family and you have to enjoy the day. You have to enjoy, I mean, I love my little office. That's the back garden back here and it's really pretty. I look out there and, and, I, and I hear some birds and we got a desert tortoise walking around in the grass and the puppy and you got to enjoy the minutes because if you say to yourself, I'm going to be sitting around waiting for a year before we know anything about whether this is going anywhere and the ups and downs and sometimes they like it and sometimes they don't, you go out of your mind. It's, it's not a sprint, it's an endurance race. And you've got to stay cheerful and upbeat and you've got to keep coming up with new, fresh ideas on turn on a dime and they go, well, gosh, we like this, but this part here is bumping us. And you've got to be ready to go, oh, good, we don't like this part that you don't like either. And you've got to let go, you know, they say, kill your darlings. Uh, stuff that you just, they don't like it, it's dead. And you've got to find a new way. And when I was just starting out, when they didn't like something, I panicked because It was all like that was like, if I got to come up with something else, I don't know what I'll do because this was it, man. I just spent myself on this one idea. So when they didn't like it, I freaked out. Now, years gone by, it's like, you know what? You came up with that one idea, you'll come up with another idea. And if you don't waste your energy worrying about how hard it is to come up with the next idea, then you have energy to come up with ideas. And um, so a year, I, you know, I knew it would be about a year. And I'm, we're so excited because now it's, it has a chance to go to the next level. Uh, but when we first turned it in, you know, when you first pitched it and they said they liked the idea and they wanted to buy, buy they wanted to hire us, that was exciting. And then when we turned in an outline and they liked that, that was exciting. You, you, need, you get some steps along the way. And then when they turned in the first draft and they liked that, they had a lot of notes. We knew we'd be writing a whole new draft, but they liked where we were going. This is one of those great projects where each set of revisions have been in the same direction. In other words, they're honing. It's, it's a lot of times you work for a producer, they don't know what they want, you'll turn in a draft and then they'll give you notes and the notes are write an entire new movie, new direction. And then you're just hopping from place to place, from idea to idea, and you never have a chance for the idea to get better. But only you know, if they like the draft and you can keep refining and honing, that's when you have a chance of writing something that actually doesn't suck because you've got to keep revising. Um, but if your revision is a page one rewrite every time, then you never see the growth and the benefit of the time spent. On this script, you see a year's worth of work because it's, it's honing. We work on this little section, we work on this little character. Oh, good, these characters are working now, let's spend time on these other characters. So each pass has made it uh, come more to life. Any other questions on that part of things? Yeah, Nick. Mr. Oh, I'll let Ken moderate, go ahead. Yeah, Nick in the back, he's a film student, so okay. you can go first, yeah. So sorry, sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're working on one project for a full year, do you ever like pick up little projects during that year time frame to like take a step back and work on something else? It or depends. is it really that project for the whole year that you're working on every day? That's a great question. So it depends on the project. Uh, you know, if you're on a smaller projects when you're first starting out, you tend to, you need just money-wise, you need to be trying to keep a couple things going at once. Uh, a big Disney musical uh, pays well enough that you can and should focus on that exclusively. Uh, it's really a rare position to be in, to, 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 to have their trust. And uh, I, I don't do anything else while I'm on this. I, I just think about Enchanted. 
and uh, and that's it's a real it's a privilege for me because I can really pour my soul into it, and uh, and and it's you know you don't mess around on something like that. We have in our careers worked on number a number. The flip side is when you're working for the studios you're working for where you need the cloud leverage, um, it pisses them off. But when you've got two gigs going, they know they don't own you. And so when the studio is sort of beating you up and mistreating you and asking you to do too much for free, it's nice to have that second job. Most contracts are exclusive. You're really not supposed to have that. But you can you do it in such a way that you started a gig, you were working on something before they hired you, and you tell them you'll do them in second position. But that's that's a luxury of the past. More, there aren't that many jobs out there now, and so we, we take the jobs that are in front of us, and usually there aren't two at once. We do find that we need to start pitching on things as one job is sort of, we get the animal in the cage, it may be a couple more months on it, but you've done the, the hardest part, and now you're gonna have more time in between the note sessions. Then you start taking meetings and start pitching on other things, because there's a huge lag time between the time you start pitching on something and the time you get paid. We started pitching on this project over a year ago. We pitched on it for several months. We landed the gig a year ago. We got paid in October. Um, and then we just got paid again uh, in February, I think, when we turned that draft in. right? And then we got paid again just recently. The checks are, thank God, enough to, to carry you for the you have to put your money in the bank when you get a nice check. You bet that check's got to last. So, um, but yes, yeah, so it's good when you can work. Now, other people, smaller projects, you tend to be juggling a lot of things at once. Uh, but I much prefer this way. It's hard to write one movie well. Uh, but there are guys out there that are like Mozart. They're crank they got six things going, and they're jumping from one to the next, and God bless them. I don't have that bandwidth. Very good. Very good. There was well, another question. Well, yeah. Well, I a, a, yeah. I had a question that you started to and you sort of answered. Uh, and it's uh, from a production standpoint as far as uh, the studios go. When you're hired on a studio project or any project, are you paid uh, completely step by step an outline or first draft, whatever, when the work is done? Or is there any work people pay for beforehand? Or what's the typical? Yeah. That's Did you do all that? The, 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 no more salary. I got a salary. And there was a time when they hired you by the week, you know, ages ago. Now it's all uh, step deal contracts, you know, you. You get paid to write a treatment, an outline. You know, it used to be there were like four steps, five steps guaranteed in the deal. When you got a movie, lately it's all one-step deals. They'll pay you. The treatment is implied to get paid for it, and then several are optional, which are the rules for statement. David, David yeah. we lost the last ten seconds. Could you give us that that last ten seconds, please? If you can, I, I, they're gone for me. So I have no idea what happened. It was like this dark uh, vacuum. About it was the steps. Black. About the steps. Tell us about the steps. If you're uh, they came in. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm aware. I just I'm saying that the. <laughs> it's still kind of just sucked that life out of it. What happened? In Washington, they're trying. I wonder if I let, give it. We'll give it another minute or two. But if it doesn't get better, I've got five bars here. But. Like, like I said, sure. there's something weird that happens in the throw from here to the house. So I may need to go in the house. To, you know, it's we'll probably get. at our end, David. So we'll just keep going. We've had good luck. Yeah, let's, we're going to do a test. We're going to. I'm going to. I'm going to move. Where'd you go? I'm going to move. Uh, are you guys still there? I'm going to move yes. into the house and see if we get a better signal. Okay. Okay. It's probably us. Sure. By the way, you can see the. There's the turtle. Let's go see Mr. T. Let's go see. <laughs> Here we are back here. Can you guys hear me? Yep. No. We're good. Where you come Where is he? Mr. T, you there? Here's Mr. T. I don't know. Could you guys see that? Uh, yeah, there he is. Yeah. I can't hear you. What's going on here? Can you guys hear me? Yep. We got you. Did you see the turtle? Yes, we did. He's looking uh, he's in the sun. Nice and warm. All right. Is the uh, signal any better in here? So far, so good. Let's just keep going. Yeah, let's see how it goes. We'll just wave at you if we have a problem. So far, right. that, just that one dead spot for a long gap. Occasionally, it kind of gets digital, but we, we've stayed with you. We're good. Okay, well, let's see if this is a little better here. Let's see what's going on here. I don't like the lighting in here, though, do you? It's not good lighting. Oh, uh, lighting is always better. That's all right. We like your voice. You've got a good face. <laughs> nice face. <laughs> it might be better. Let's see what happened here. 
Hello, troops. There we go. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay. Nice picture. Of the so what we were, we were talking about is the steps and, and how it used to be one way, but now it's more to steps one at a time, I think is what you're saying. Yeah, you usually get a one-step deal. Disney, God bless them, we got a three-step deal on this. Uh, they like to pitch enough, and we were paid guaranteed treatment, first draft, revision. Wow. Now, that first, that first draft turns into three or four free redrafts. That's just the way it works now. <laughs> it's a real shame because they're really eating away at, at a writer's salary. And you got a family to take care of, and they don't think anything of it. They just say, "Well, that's the way the business is." Well, that's yeah. the way they—that's the way they've made the business, uh, yeah. because there aren't that many jobs, and the writers are, you know, nervous about you know make, upsetting an employer. So you kind of do what they ask, and 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 they it gets worse and worse that that part, and it's a shame. Uh, you'd think that uh, some of these guys would have a little more of of a conscience about that, but that's just part of the business. And happily, if you get you know, on a big enough project, like I said, the salaries are enough that you can, uh, if they don't stretch it out too far, you can get by, you know, without needing to dip into your uh, home equity line. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I mean, thank God over 30 years, you know, we own most of our house and it's a nice home, you know, in a nice neighborhood in LA. And uh, so we're, I'm not, I'm not starving over here. Uh, you know, my kids have had wonderful educational opportunities and, but it's still, we're, we, you know, we're bringing the profits. We're creating the material that make these profits. I think the company's turned. I heard the number the other day, and I don't remember. It's forty-two or twenty-four. It was a big number, billion dollars in profits. And um, and uh, there was a statistic that they could. We're having some trouble with the health and pension plan. Uh, the studios could fix the health and pension plan without cutting anybody's uh, benefits whatsoever for about one hundred and fifty million dollars over three years. I think it is which is 0.3 of 1% of, the, of that profit, you know? So they don't want to do that. But anyway, uh, they're doing fine, and uh, <laughs> we're cranking out the material, and it would be nice for them to share. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Well, you ought to talk to somebody at the Writers Guild. Maybe they could help you out. <laughs> well, I, you know, that, that's, why, that's why we struck. I was vice president during the strike. Oh. And, yeah. and that, that was that, what that was about. Okay, so uh, should we move on to some of the creative stuff? Yeah, please, please carry on with whatever you want to present. And you know, I think somewhere on here, and saving questions. Somewhere on here, there should be a, um, a a screen sharing or something like that. Is Dwayne around? Does he know how that works? Yeah, he's coming up. Oh, you're Dwayne. I'm Dwayne here. Hey, Dwayne. So, uh, if I wanted to share a document with you guys, how do I do that? Okay. If you go to the the students here, no more. Yeah. So if you go to the left side of your screen, there's a bunch of icons. I got it. Screen share. Yep, that's it. All right. So desktop, Google Hangouts, scan so select a window. Let's see. I was gonna try and find something for you guys here. Start screen share. Okay, that's I don't want okay, here we go. So you guys are looking at that. You don't need to see this. Let me see that. I gotta find. Uh, here we go. Okay, so is the screen share still on, or did it go off? No, not up. Hang on here. Screen share. There we go. There's something. Bingo. Okay. Let's see. All right. So is that up? Yep. yep. Yeah. Now, if I do this, let's see if it goes into a. Um, Okay, so are you seeing? Are you seeing my whole screen, or are you just seeing some pretty colors? We see the whole screen. So you see the the clock and and the next slide and everything. Yeah. Yep. So so you got a full screen from there. Okay, you need so to press the full screen button, apparently, David, if you want us to see full screen. Yeah, I want you just to see the slide. So I guess I go to. Uh, go to from. Sorry. Yeah, just do your start button. Start button. Do it. I'd share. Play from start. Let's see. There you go. Like that. So you're seeing just the slide now? No. no. Really? Oh, I got to go back to screen share, I think. All right. Let's try that. And. Okay. Here we go. How's that? No. no I'm saying you have to. I think you have to hit your um, 
Your, your top left on the top left where it says from current slide, play slideshow. Yeah. Because it, it says I'm screen sharing. Yeah, you are screen sharing. And what are you seeing? We see your screen. We see we see your slides on the left hand in a column, all the slides you've got. So if you hit play if you hit your play slideshow, yeah. It uh it should just play it at, at full screen. How's that? Now? No. No, no I'm program. wrong. I'm wrong because we only because you, that plays it to a different. You see whatever he sees. Yeah, we're just gonna we're see seeing what you see, David. But go ahead. I think I think we see it. We, got, we see the image, so we're in good shape. How, about, how about now? No, nope. same thing. Wow. So what? So you're seeing the image plus you're you're seeing the program, right? Right. Yep. That's yep. annoying. That's right. That is annoying. But all right, fine. We'll look at that. That's okay. Not the end of the world. Okay. So look. Uh, so this is just a little bit about what I go through. Now, by the way, you can't see it close enough because it's, I, but now you're seeing, are you seeing just that one program or are you seeing anything else on my desk? Just the one program. So I should try and make that bigger anyway, right? Sure. It, that didn't do anything, did it? The slide stays the same size. Okay, well that's weird, but what are you gonna do? Yeah, that's all right. We get the idea, this is cool. This is Can you read cool. it? Can you read it? Yes. yes. Yeah. We're looking at our, if we look off to, we're, if we're not looking at you and the screens, because we're looking at the bigger screen on the wall. All right, good. So um, the, the next slide has what looks like profanity, but the middle letters have been blocked out, but it still looks like a bad word, so I apologize for that. Is there anybody who will be offended by that? If there's people who will be offended by language, this, this came right out of Scientific American, but I actually took out, like I said, I blotched out some of the letters. But so this is the creative process in my mind. I saw this in Scientific American. I just loved it because it really captured what goes on. Work begins, right? And then what happens in this whole line is, um, is we spend this entire time. <laughs> and then, um, hang on here, because I can still. Yeah. And then, where'd it go? And then uh, here's the deadline, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what do we do for the for the next little chunk of time? We panic. <laughs> and then what do we do for this last little bit? It's uh, all the work of all the line. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's pretty much the creative process, right? <laughs> and um, and then the other the other corollary process that goes with that is uh, this is just a different model is the first step is you're very excited about it. This is awesome. The next step is it's harder than you thought. And the next step is uh, <laughs> it's not very good. And then, and then things get worse because you take it personally. <laughs> but then, if you're lucky, it's it might work, and then uh, and then, hey, it's awesome. And then, unfortunately, but then, then, then it starts over because then you, <laughs> either you get the either you get the notes or you get the the reviews or whatever, and then you got to go through. And, and so, all of the creative process and most of life is is going through the series, and you've got to find a way to um, to secure your your ego and to secure your self esteem in something other than the creative process, or you will wind up. Uh, like, um, you know, so many of, of the people that I love in the business who have passed away because they couldn't take it. Because they took it too personally. They were looking for their identity and for their, um, you know, affirmation in, uh, in, the, in the work. So you got to find a way to enjoy the work even when it's hellish, okay? Any questions so far? That makes great sense. <laughs> okay. Anybody? Any questions? In? I have a quick question. Are there any of your many screenplays that you've enjoyed the entire process? You didn't get tired of the story, you just really enjoyed writing that screenplay? No. <laughs> there we go. So when they came closer. Absolutely not. Now I will say that this project that I'm on now, oh, but you know what, it's my fault because the reason I don't enjoy it is the lack of faith. 
is uh, and by the way I have no idea what, what do you guys have on the screen now do you see me anywhere or no, no, no we've got we've got the, the diagram okay well, let me so I'll shut off screen sharing for a second and then we'll come back to that okay now I'm back right there you go well, now we see you hmm, very cool so uh, the reason I haven't enjoyed it is because of a lack of faith because writing so much of the time you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know if you're going to solve it or when or how and just in the last couple of years, you know, like I said, I've been at this for a while, I've begun to realize my job isn't to be clever and smart and come up with a great scene. My job is to go back out in the office we were just in and do the work, is put my head down. And a buddy of mine is running a TV show on ABC Family now called Stitchers. And he doesn't know what's going to happen if they get a pickup. They did 13 episodes, and he's worked his, you know, last year and a half on this thing. It's given it, given it his all. And he realizes it's out of his hands. All he can do is just each day go in and put in the hours. And when you do that, and you'll hear a number of famous creative types. David Mamet talks about that. Go to work, get there on time, go home when, it, when, when it's time to go home. And do your best job while you're there. And then let go of, the, of your, of your uh, worry about the results because all you can control is whether or not you're putting in your time. Um, so hang on a second. I'm looking for this. Okay, now what happened was I've lost, not that I care, but I just, usually there's a little tiny thing of me so I know what, what, what you're seeing. Uh, Dwayne, any idea how I get that back? Oh, no. All right. You're, yeah. you're a great uh, IT guy, Dwayne, I just got to say. <laughs> <laughs> he says he's, he's not my job. <laughs> no, he's not my job. That's, that's funny. He's just the smartest IT guy in the room. You know? He went away, whatever. Let's see what this is. Oh, hang on. I think maybe this. I got it. <laughs> There's a little box on the top that shows a box within a box. Now, well, you guys can kind of see. <laughs> um, I have a, let me see if I go over here. Maybe if I turn this way, we'll get better lighting because the windows are behind me. Here, that does. I just, you know, like I said, I'm part director, so I like, there, that's better lighting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah because right. now the windows are facing me like that. Ah. <laughs> 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 so, um, so, and one of the reasons you need all that faith, let's go back to screen sharing. Um, hang on here. Is the screen sharing. Okay, and we want to go back to this thing. I'm really disappointed that it won't show you the whole thing because my screen is the whole thing if I push that button. It's not fair. Uh, and, that, and this makes it small, right? It's fine. We see it. It's good. Ah, fine. It's good. You say it's fine. There should be a button. Oh, wait a second. Watch this. That oh, helps, right? Well, we it made it bigger, but within the small box. Yeah, but it, but it made the stuff bigger. That's at least good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Oh, that's All right. So anyway, the next thing. So, so, one of the, so this going in every day is basically I, a lot of times I'll say I look at myself as a miner. <laughs> My job is just to go in there and be in there and dig. And what I'm looking for, if you dig all day, if you run your stopwatch, I'll, do, I'll run a stopwatch on my writing. I'll, you know, I say I got to... Over the course of an eight-hour day, you know, I break for lunch. I spend way too much time on the internet surfing for idiot cat pictures and looking at. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the price of uh, the cover that I want for my computer is finally down, you know, I, I just waste time. It's called you know procrastination. It's that big red part of the graph we looked at. It's it's this part, right? This nice red part. <laughs> A lot of time, too much time spent there. Um, but you're looking for this, right? You spend, you spend uh, you know, eight hours in that mine, and if you keep digging, every couple days, you'll find something you can use. And the more time you spend digging, the more of these you'll find. And then you string these together, and you start to have a story. And, um, of course, to do that, you got to dig through a lot of crap. you got to bring a lot of dirt and crud up out of the mine. And that's no fun. That part feels like failure. And... Um, that's, I think, one of the reasons we, we um, that's one of the reasons that we waste so much time is because facing that empty page is terrifying because you're digging up all this dirt and it's not good. And you feel you've, that middle line of the other step, I am crap. That's how you feel when all you're bringing. But if you refocus and you say, you know what? My job is to dig. So if I dug all day and all I brought up was dirt, good on me. I did my job. And I should be able to relax. And that relaxation frees your brain up because anxiety crushes creativity. And now I can relax and start to go.
But you know what? When the idea is supposed to come, God will bring me the idea. As long as I'm doing my work, as long as I'm down there digging. If I don't go in the mine shaft and I don't start digging, I ain't going to get anything. So there are a lot of different ways to dig. Um, I uh, Let's see here. You guys got the screen back? Yeah. Yep. I like to drive. I drive around. When I'm first thinking about ideas, I drive around and I just listen to music and I let myself feel you know, on Enchanted, it was like, okay, what do they want to do, you know? And I just would think about the story issues, you know? Uh, I can't talk too much specifically about Enchanted, but you just, you just, I, I work from an emotional place, so I'll just think about feelings and and, uh, and just who's my main character and what's, the, what's emotionally at stake and what do they care about, you know, that kind of thing. And little ideas and pieces of it will come and I'll just, I'll percolate, it's percolating. Another great place to do this is in the shower. I don't usually shower with her. Um, <laughs> my wife wouldn't appreciate that. But they say that there's like negative ions or something that come out of shower water. I don't know. But I do notice that I, a shower is a good place. Although now we're having a drought in California. So I'm doing much less thinking in the shower because I shower while I'm lathering. Anyway. Uh, another great way is that like what my turtle's doing out there is to walk. And um, the thing about the walking is uh, is – it, they say the same with the driving. They say that it frees up your uh, le the, the right side of your brain. And so I'll walk, I'll walk like this. I'll kind of, I'll kind of like, um, I'll be thinking, you know, and I'll be like, okay. But I don't, I'm not walking too fast. If you're walking fast, I feel my right side of my brain is tied up and my left takes over because I got to look and see where I'm walking, right? But if I, and if I walk too slow, then I'm afraid I'll get eaten by a wild animal or something or mugged because <laughs> it's like, you know, delusional. But if you get this kind of pacey, this works. I get into a zone and I can think just about the issue, like what's going on, you know? And um, so that's a really great uh, technique to, to kind of free your brain up, all right? Um, let's see what's next on our little list of stuff here. So we'll go back to some sharing. So I'm guessing, by the way, the signal is better in the house. Is that, was I right about that? Yeah, yeah. we're good. All right, I'm going to have. I'm going to get to buy an extender or something so that office gets decent speed. Because it's interesting. It shows uh, that I got five bars, but it's not traveling at a good speed. Okay, then, uh, then I start writing. I journal, right? And I'll journal. I will write questions. Like, who's my main character? What do they want? What's in their way? These are important questions, right? Who stands in their way? What do they need? You know, there's, there's the difference between want and need. Um, you know, uh, I, I like to talk about, um, did, did everybody see, um, uh, or did anybody see, uh, what's the Julia Roberts movie where she's uh, helping the families that are stuck in the bad town with the bad water? Aaron Brockovich, Aaron Brockovich right. So, um, I didn't stop it. Okay, there we go. Aaron Brockovich is an interesting movie because what is what is that is that movie about a woman trying to help families? Would you say? Yes. No. Good for you. What's your name? Shanna. Go, Shanna. What would you say the movie's about? A woman trying to find herself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just based on how you asked the question, I figured it was no. <laughs> good for you. So, you, but you, but you also, but you, the other part you got without, based on how I, how I, you got it on your own. None of these movies are about, um, about the, it always has to be about somebody's primary need. So in film students, you know, when I was, everybody was always writing a movie about, especially Christian film students, there was somebody who was always going to go help a bunch of poor people. Or, or in my case, with that dancing, it started out with going to help uh, prostitutes because young men have this fantasy about saving prostitutes. Uh, I mean, a lot of those films, <laughs> films get written in film school for short films, especially religious uh, film schools. So the problem with that is it's not a primary need. Your character needs to have a primary need. And Aaron Brockovich didn't have a primary need to go help other families. We don't root for that. We root, it has to be life or death for the character. Aaron Brockovich was broke and she couldn't feed her family. So she was just trying to feed her family. And in the process of doing that, she got sucked into this situation with all these other families, and those families mirrored her family, so thematically it still worked. And and in the process, as Shanna, Shanna, Shanna? Shanna. Shanna, as Shanna pointed out, she found out what she was made of. 
So it was really a personal journey of someone finding their own inner strength and who they were. And we will lean forward in our chair for that because that's a real story. So when we're typing on, in our journal at the beginning when I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing, I'll be writing in my journal, wh whose story is it? What do they want? What's at stake? What do they need? Um, another one of my favorites is uh, uh, in that primal need. In fact, that's I think that's one of my slides here. It's probably the next slide. So when you're typing those questions, uh, are you guys back on screen? Can you see this thing? Yes. All right. So um, it, it needs to be a, a caveman want. It needs to be what my, you, my writing partner and I talk about, a visceral caveman want. So for her, it was, um, you know, for Aaron Brockovich, it was uh, taking care of her family. You know, father-son relationships are big. Uh, you know, uh, it, it has to be a life or death, right? Now, in a romantic comedy, life or death is defined by the relationship. Will the relationship live or die, right? Um, but so, so let's say uh, Ocean's Eleven. Anybody see Ocean's Eleven? Yeah. Sure. So, so or, or the or the the Italian job is another one. You can never make a movie about money. You can't. The goal can't be money because nobody cares about money. Deep down, we don't care. We care about what money buys, but we don't care about the money. So, what do you do in these movies? So we'll watch. We do like a good action, but the stakes have to be life or death. And in a bank robbery, whether or not they'll get the money, we just ultimately don't care. So when we meet George Clooney in Ocean's Eleven, what's his deal? It's revenge, right? Didn't this guy put him in jail yeah. uh, for all this time? He got put in jail, and he, it seems to be so. Revenge is a story. Revenge is an age-old story. Goes back to the Bible. That's a caveman want. You wronged me. I will kill you. Um, but it's not emotional enough. Revenge, because we don't ultimately deep down root for revenge. We don't feel good about it. Um, so how do they transform that into a caveman want? The reveal is that uh what's his name uh the cuban fellow uh who runs the garcia andy garcia andy garcia thank you he stole julia roberts so really it's a love story we're back to julia roberts aren't we <laughs> <laughs> all the roads lead to julia roberts <laughs> <laughs> so so what's going on there is is uh he wants her back and what's he going to do? He's doing this bank job. The whole thing, it turns out, is coming down to the moment that he makes Andy Garcia admit on film that he'd give up Julia Roberts for the money. And that's what it comes down to. And we are satisfied. We are satisfied at that moment because it's so rich and it's so it's a caveman want. Love, except to get my, to get my girl back, uh, to get my guy back. Those are... Um, those are caveman wants. So that's the, we. So when we're journaling, well, what am I telling? If you get, if you're stuck on a story, usually it's because you don't know what your character wants. That's almost always the primary thing that has you stuck on your story. And then if you know what they want, usually it isn't uh, it isn't a caveman want, um, and it, or it's not an emotional an emotional need. When you get stuck on that, then I go to a place. I just like I look inside and I go, well, where's my where am I wounded? Where's my pain? And I, I, I begin to see how I can put that on my character because we go to the theater to be moved, ultimately. We want to feel more alive. We ride, the, we ride the roller coaster for that reason. You know, we go to the movies for that reason. We go to the theater. People who do drugs, uh, people who fight with their spouse and their boyfriend and their girlfriend constantly. Every, everybody is looking to push off their mortality with a moment of feeling some sort of exhilaration, even if it's killing them. Uh, and so when we're looking at a movie and telling a story, that story has to tell the story of somebody either overcoming or fail to, failing to overcome these uh, kinds of odds. I don't think there's any other slides on there that we need to look at. Let me see. Um, well, I, mean, this is a, I, did this, I did this lecture for some folks that were more interested in this kind of thing, but um, I think that it's important to, to know what these ideas are coming uh, from somewhere, and uh, you need to be really grateful when it works out, and and it, that allows you to go back into the um, back into the cave and dig back into the mine, and to go wow, I to be grateful that hey, I spent the time in there today, and I was able to overcome my temptation to surf the internet for dancing mice, and instead I wrote <laughs> for the right number of hours. I I ran my stopwatch. I, I tend to run a stopwatch on days when I don't feel really motivated. And it needs to hit four hours. 
But that's four hours of solid. I clicked it off when I reached for a cookie. I clicked it off when I answered the phone. I clicked it off if I went on the internet. I clicked it off if my mind started to wander. So when those four hours come in, those are four solid hours writing, thinking, journaling. The beginning of a project four is hard to get to because the project sort of pushes you away. It doesn't really, but our own fear of all the bad stuff we're writing on the empty page makes it hard to show up. So it's harder. Near the end of the project, I'll go six. Eight. Dave. No. What? Okay. Oh, we lost you for a second. Uh, about five seconds. We're back. Yep. I just did some time travel. I was over in Europe for a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, was back. I'm back. I'm sorry about that. I had to take care of something over there. Did you get a baguette? I did get a baguette. <laughs> what did you ask? Uh, yeah, chocolate, uh, you know, Paris, you know, baguette, hot chocolate. I do, I do like a baguette and some hot chocolate, but I didn't go to Paris. It's, uh, it's, it's hard in Paris right now. It's, uh, they're speaking French, and I just, I'm not using any good, so. Très <laughs> mal, <laughs> my French. I don't know what to say. So, um, okay, so there's that. Now, what, how much time have we got? How are we doing? About 20 minutes. Uh, any questions so far? Shanna. 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 Shanna, yeah. Shanna's an actress, actually. She's not. In, she's not in our class, but she heard you were coming, and she wanted to hear you. Hear you. So I'm. I'm shocked. I'm shocked to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait. I'm sorry. I'm gonna interrupt for just a second. We were at a. We were at a, a presentation of a studio that's in another city, and she joined us there too. And I said a really good actress could actually cry out of her left eye on cue. She did it. Damn. She did it right there in class. So she's One good. Eye? Her left eye. One eye cry. Yeah. I mean, it took, it took me a second. It took her, you know, 30 seconds, but she did it. Damn. <laughs> wow, that's good. good. Shanna's question. Well, thank you. Um, I actually was wondering about how you do uh, collaborative writing, how that process works, because um, I have tried to do that a little bit with some people, and I'm not totally clear on, like, do you come together for ideas and then separate and take turns writing different pieces, or do you trade it back and forth, or how do you do collaborative writing? That's a great question, and it, it, there are as many ways to collaborate as there are collaborators. Um, the way my writing partner and I work is uh, I need, we both need to think some before we come into it, uh, just to have something in our heads, you know. So the driving, showering, walking, thinking, journaling, you know, here and there, and then we get together. I'm very babbly, you know, I babble a lot, and I make him crazy because he's kind of quiet. So we have to limit it, like a two, three hour block where I babble. I just, I do better with an audience. I think at a higher level, I, my need to please, my desire to put on a show, I rise to the occasion. So I think of stuff when there are people in the room that I just don't think of if I'm sitting and only quietly typing. Now, as I've gotten older and I've gotten better at, at using my mind on its own, I actually do a lot, I do come up with a lot of great stuff just sitting and typing now. But I still do better on the fly with an audience and that's what I use my partner for. But it exhausts him, so we, we, limit, <laughs> we limit the time on that, and, uh, and then we then we brainstorm, and then we wrestle. It's you know I also I, I do some I study some Talmud, and the way you study Talmud is you usually have a partner and you wrestle over these ideas and you say, but if it means that, then what about this? And but if it meant that, why didn't it say it this other way? And and that's how we do the story. If you're going to say that in the third act it's all about this, then why was she doing this in Act One? Oh, because what? And we're, rest, we're wrestling, we're arguing, and it forces us uh, to rise to a level that's better than you know, the sum of our parts. Um, but then what we do is, then we kind of outline, we kind of break the rough idea and, the, and the, the broad outline strokes of the story together. So we'll meet at the Coffee Bean, you know, it's a coffee shop here, and we'll meet there all day. We have a lot of friends there, people know us, There's a lot of writers hang out there, and, and the people see us there, and we're wrestling it through, and we're working it out. And once we kind of have the outline, we know where we're going, then we split up, but it depends. Then we go to the studio and we pitch it, right? We rehearse and we pitch it. Once they buy it, then we, we, we'll, once we have, we're actually drafting like, you know, what we've been doing, then we just divide it up and conquer. And you take uh, the first act, I'll take the second act, and, uh, and we, we get two, three weeks, we don't see each other. And then we, we send each other the scenes back and forth by email, and then we punch up each other's scenes. If there's a lot of changes, then we'll call first and say, hey, here's what I think we could do with this to make sure the other guy signs on. Otherwise, you piss him off. You just rewrite me without telling me why. And you didn't understand what I was trying to do. That'll piss me off. So I'll say, give me the notes. 
then let me tell you what I was trying to accomplish. And then he'll do this all the time because I'm better at getting exactly what I had on my head on the page. And he's better at coming up with these crazy flights of fancy that lift the thing above what you expected, right? But he won't use words in just the right way that you can see exactly what he meant. So I'll go, well, I have this problem with it. And he'll go, no, but that, and I'll go, oh, that's what you were trying to do. I like that. Could we do it like this? And he'll go, oh, yeah, that's great. And then boom, I'm off and running. So we do try and agree on what the changes are going to be rather than just, let me take a pass at you. I have a whole different idea, which is sort of disrespectful. And it would piss us off. So, so we, we do that kind of middle ground thing. And then we, we write, and then it goes back and forth. And the final step is we come together when it's sort of written and we go through, we just make notes to ourselves and we have a meeting, we go through and we each bring up the notes that we want and anything that we're troubled by, we punch it up together. And that's the most fun because that's really collaborative. And that's when you come up with jokes that are much funnier because the one guy will pitch half of it, the other guy will tip it in and then bang, bang, bang. You know, it, that's, that's the most fun. Great question. Very cool. Thank you. And can, I ask about, yeah, can I ask about... Uh, the difference, if there is any, for writing for live action and animation. There's not much difference, I gotta say. Uh, you know, it, it used to be that people did write it differently. It used to be that it was all storyboarded and they didn't even have writers. You know, back in the, you know, when Disney was in the heyday in the 30s and 40s, 50s, they didn't have writers. Somewhere when the studio system got more involved in animation and everyone was doing it, they needed a script and it, it started to shift to the more you know, standard paradigm of a screenplay first and then, and then the writing. Um, so you got solid characters, you have solid wants and needs. The image that, oh, it's animated, it could be anything. Um, it still has to be grounded and nobody cares, you know? So I, I don't really find it to be that much different. You kind of need to know the budget. You kind of, you know, it's easier to do crazy monsters in animation than it is in, in, uh, in live action. But like a big crowd scene, Someone's got to animate all those little crowd people and you're paying, you know, for the pencil miles. Uh, but, you know, animation questions you can, you can feel to Ken because he's spending a lot of time in that studio and knows what that's about, is, you know. Uh, sure. Yeah. You, you want it to read like a, like a live action script, really. Um, it needs to be real and grounded and we need to care about those characters. Okay, so we have, a, we have a just, what, 10, 15 minutes left? Yeah, about 10 or so. The class ends at 50, uh, 50 minutes past. Yeah, 10 minutes too. Okay, so let me give you a couple options. There's a couple exercises we can do. I have an exercise I do for brainstorming that's kind of fun. We play some music and you guys have to journal, have to write some stuff down afterwards. And then we kind of try and make a story out of it. That would probably use up all the time if we did that. Um, it gives you, it's, a, it's an idea, it's a brainstorming technique. I don't think ultimately that's as helpful because you can read about that, although it's, it's just fun. Um, and it, it'll show you how you don't have to really think of stories and characters. You have to think of little pieces, those little nuggets we were talking about, and then you string them together. So that's an interesting exercise. The other thing we do is we could go through some of the basic building blocks of actual writing and structure, you know, the five-part dramatic structure, Aristotle's thing. I, I kind of like to break that down, a uh, character wants and needs those things. So we can either do a little more technical stuff or we could do that exercise. Kind of up to you guys. You want to do a vote? Any thoughts, guys? Whatever, Whatever makes him talk. Whatever makes you talk more, did you hear that? <laughs> well, yeah, I expect that from an actress, but let's hear from the writers. My writing partner would not say that. Yeah, that's right, that's right. What do you guys think? Any thoughts? Gary's, I agree. He, he agrees with her. Oh, okay. I don't know this student, so. Well, then I guess, I guess, I guess we won't do the exercise. Um, they're both fun, it's just, you know, you have limited time, you gotta do whatever you gotta do. So let me see if I can find. So look, when you're doing this story, um, we'll do a, sh so, so I, I studied at, at USC's film school and it happened to be that this fellow, Robert McKee, at the time he was Bob McKee, now he's like a big guru. If you ever see this movie, um, uh, Adaptation with Nick Cage about the orchids, the orchid thief, there's a whole runner in there with Bob McKee played by Brian Cox who plays him perfectly. And it was very surreal for me going to see that movie because, uh, um, the agent who was played by, uh, I forgot his name now, but the agent was playing uh, Marty Bowen, who was my agent at the time, and oh, wow. he was representing Andy Kaufman, and, and Bob McKee is a main player in the movie, and he was my writing professor, and I watched it at the Writers Guild with 
Charlie Kaufman and Nick Cage doing Q and A at the end of it. So it was a very surreal. And then they recreated Marty Bowen's office, and Marty tells this ridiculously horrible story about women that he'd had various relationships with in various inappropriate ways, and uh, and that was Marty. So it was all just very, very cool, very fun to watch, very surreal. But Bob McKee is very well portrayed in that, and he happened to just be a writing professor at USC at the time when I was there. But his five-part dramatic structure, which isn't his, he was just relating Aristotle's five-part dramatic structure, really, I was like, oh, that's how we write. And uh, that plus a lot of practice and a lot of years. But have you guys covered this at all, the five-part dramatic structure? No. no. In fact, I, I may jump up to the board and write it down as you comment on it. Uh, yeah, I, I can probably find, uh, let's see here if we can get a document that has that. Let's see what this is. Um, let's see here. And it's starting. Okay, okay. Here we go. That's that. Where'd it go? I have here. There we go. It's right here. So, can you guys see? I just make this bigger and you just have that. Um, just call out to the inciting incident. Yeah, see those? So, uh, let me make that bigger. We like seeing you. Escalating series of events. Yeah. There you go, sorry, I got up to here. Right there, okay? I don't know what the two is for, but inciting incident, escalating series of events, leading to a crisis, a climax, and a resolution. That's Aristotle, right? So, so what's an inciting incident? I'll give you an example that Bob gave from a student film. I'm gonna come back since, uh, I, I, I'm gonna take it away. Can you, do you guys need it for a second longer, or are you good? Oh. I just put it on the board, the, the basics, yeah. Okay. So, so um, Bob McKee showed this wonderful short film. He didn't show it, he described this film. It was a short film that someone did that he said was perfect five-part dramatic structure, and this changed my life. A, a little old man, the movie opens, a super eight film, no dialogue, camera panning around a room, a little apartment filled with little tchotchkes and doodads, old beat up stuff. Everything's got a break or a crack has been glued together. You know, it's a guy that doesn't have any money, but he obviously collects little beautiful artifacts that are all broken in some way. He has nothing that isn't, you know, in some way. And then we see this old guy, and he's in his little apartment. He looks out the window, and a garbage truck pulls up outside and dumps a bunch of stuff in this empty lot in this rundown neighborhood and drives away. Inciting incident. This is the thing that comes to tell my character that his life is now going to turn and go in a new direction. All right? So the man goes downstairs and he rubbishes through the trash and he finds a teacup, which is gorgeous. It has a little chink in the, in the rim, but it's lovely. And he looks at it and he loves it and he puts it to his chest and he takes it home and he goes up the stairs and he puts it on the mantel next to um, a little tea saucer that matches this teacup that it turns out he has, which has also got a crack in it. It's been glued together. Next day he wakes up, he looks outside and um, there are some boys playing that don't look very nice, but he thinks, okay, I'm gonna get out there and see if there's anything else in the trash. And he goes down, he's digging in the trash, and the boys frighten him, and they're chasing him and scaring him, but he finds another teacup. This one's got a broken handle, but he, he finds the other piece, and he runs away from the boys. This is an escalation, right? He's going, he's trying to continue his collection, but he's got this, now there's some danger involved. Next day, he goes back, and it has snowed, and everything is covered in snow, and he's, digging through the snow with his bare hands and he's digging and he's digging and he's digging and his hands begin to bleed from the frostbite and the snow and the rocks and the snow and then some dogs come and they chase him and, and he's hitting him with a stick and he's still digging and he manages to scare them away with a rock and he, he's exhausted but he finds a teapot and it's perfect. It's perfect. There's not a chip in it and he cradles it to his chest and he goes back home and he's going up the stairs, but now he's all wet from the snow, and he gets to the top step, and in the water, he slips. And he reaches out, clutching the, he's clutching the teapot. Yeah, this is a wider shot. He's clutching the teapot to his chest, and he reaches out to grab the rail, and the rail gives way. The, the handrail pulls out of the wall. And now he's got to make a choice. He's reached a, a crisis. He, a crisis is a place where we have to make a choice. And now comes the climax is what happens when he makes his choice. 
and he lets go of the handrail and he clutches the teapot with his other hand and he falls backwards down the stairs. And he lands at the bottom of the stairs and his hand opens up and the teapot rolls down completely unbroken. And that's the end of the movie. We okay? Ken, you're making faces. I'm just trying to check the power issue. I'll plug mine in. You're, go ahead, keep going. I'm just gonna get some power to this laptop. Okay. Um, Ken has always been willing to share his power, which is very nice. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so here's our five part dramatic structure. Inciting incident, trash can shows up. Escalating series of events, right? Um, in which he's trying to get this art together, but each time it's harder and harder. He faces greater challenges, right? Building to a crisis, which is a moment where he's got to make a decision. He's going to decide what he really cares about. And this, and, and the crisis, uh, the climax is when he makes that decision and we see what happens and that's letting go and falling down the stairs. And the resolution is that he's passed away. It's not a comedy, it's a tragedy. And there's the art. Now I personally think that was a horrible choice because I, I, I'm a big believer that we, we preserve life at all costs, that, that life is the, is the sacred thing. And that he's, you know, Romeo and Juliet to me were just a couple of idiots. They were just... <laughs> They were young idiots whose parents should not have let them out of the house, right? Because uh, that was just a shame. These two beautiful young people had their whole lives ahead of them, and they get all caught up in this madness. And But whatever, it's a story. It's a good story. <laughs> so do you see how that structure works? I took that structure, and every film I made at film school, I applied it. My first film, a guy gets a zit. He wakes up, and he has a zit. That's your inciting incident. And he's like, I got to do the zit. And he's trying to fix it, he's trying to squeeze it, he's trying to pop it, and then it, gets, it turns into a bruise. And now it's a bloody bruise, and he's embarrassed, so he tries to put some makeup on it, and then the makeup doesn't really work, and blood comes through the makeup, so crap. So he puts a Band-Aid on it, and then he puts the makeup over the Band-Aid. Now his whole face looks ridiculous. And finally, you cut to him, and he's got a ski mask on. He's just giving it. <laughs> now he's going to school with a ski mask, but you look like a moron with a ski mask, so he takes the ski poles with him. So he looks like he's maybe going skiing right, on a nice warm day in Southern California. And he's going along and he comes to a place where a woman, he doesn't realize she's got underneath, she's in the hatchback of her car getting out of groceries, an elderly lady, and she comes out of the hatchback. She turns and sees this guy with a ski mask and a pole and she screams, she, ah! And he screams, ah! And the guy across the street, old guy across the street, looks across the street and there's a guy with a ski mask and a ski pole holding it over the woman like he's gonna beat her to death. <laughs> he's just screaming but the guy doesn't know that so he runs across the street and he punches the kid in the eye and you cut black out next morning the guy gets out of bed looks at his zit mm, gives it a kiss good zit leaves it alone turns his head he's got a huge black eye <laughs> that's the end of the movie it's called eye of the beholder right and it was like a four minute film right that's kind of but look at that structure inciting incident i got a zit escalating series of events trying to take care of that zit leading to a crisis i run into this woman with a ski mask and we're you know this and the result is the guy decks me and the resolution is i've learned you know what leave your little zit alone <laughs> things could be worse right don't focus on that these are short film ideas but look at your big movies that you love and 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 you'll see that that they're following the same structure jaws a girl gets eaten by a shark right a sheriff tries desperately to protect the people of his beach, but escalating series of events. You've got a mayor who refuses to close the beach on Labor Day or whatever day it is, right? And then you've got his family in the water, and then you've got uh, this new guy comes who, who is a scientist who's worried about more people getting in, and then Robert Shaw shows up and says, you're going to need, you know, you're going to need to go out and kill that thing. And they go out on a boat, which is a new escalation to kill the shark, it leads to the crisis, which is the shark is coming after him and the, the climax in which he takes that great shot and kills the shark. And the resolution is the guy that was afraid of the water and didn't like to swim or go in the water is now peacefully swimming back to shore to jo rejoin his family. And um, it's a, it's, it's same, that structure, that five part dramatic structure, look, there are exceptions, learn how to do it. And we do the exceptions another time, right? Get, get really good at the basics and then and then you can do the exceptions now i want to we have a few minutes left so i'm going to juxtapose that we lay that five part dramatic structure on another uh famous uh where'd it go are you guys seeing uh anything yes act one two three yep perfect it's a an arc a series like an arc 
Yes. Story arc? Okay, good. So this is a kind of a standard thing that I do at the beginning of a project. We don't do it as much as we used to, but so act two, do, do you guys see my mouse, my cursor? No. Okay. So in the middle where act two is, it goes from the big black line to this other big black line. And there's two little blue lines in the middle. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So act one would be little things that happen. The inciting incident is going to be like this red line maybe right here, right? Uh, that's where you, uh, you know, that's, that's the woman gets bit by a shark, right? And now it's like, what are we going to do? And then finally, and I don't have this jaws in my head perfectly, but basically is I've got to, Act one, at the end of act one, they re, the town realizes what's going on and we've got to save everybody from a shark, right? Act two is, is um, all the stuff going on in the city and people getting eaten and more people and him fighting with the mayor and him fighting with his family. And it builds to, we got to go out there on the boat. Actually, I think act two, they go out on the boat probably, right? So the act three, the act two break is probably they're on the boat and, and Robert Shaw gets eaten. I mean, so I'm on the boat alone, I'm screwed. And act three is how do I survive this, right? But the big, what I'm saying to you basically here is that the studios uh, tend to, although I gave you Aristotle's five part dramatic structure, the studios, I'm back, the studios tend to look for a three act structure. This is a famous thing, right? So act one is the setup, right? Uh, it's, you know, Bruce Almighty, it's all the stuff to set up that this guy is an ungrateful son of a gun. And at the end of act one, God calls him in and says, you're going to be God. And that's the act one break. This guy's life is now going in a 180 degree different direction. Liar, liar, which is one of my favorite movies. Uh, he, the kid makes the wish and at the end of act one, oh my God, I cannot lie. Right. Uh, act two is what do I do about this? Where does this take me, right? And we, to make life doable, to make writing possible, we break act two into, into three movements. Act three has a beginning, middle, and end, right? And the first part is kind of getting used to this, and we can see how this is going. Act two is the complications of, oh my God, this is much harder than I thought, and I'm in a lot of trouble. Act three is a real pressure cooker craziness building up to the act two break. Your act two curtain break is, holy crap, Things couldn't get any worse. I'm doomed. Right? That's your act two break. Uh, you know, Star Wars, the Death Star's coming to get you, and Han Solo's going out on his own. We're on our own. We're screwed. And then act three is, oh, my God, we rise to the occasion. Right? And then act three is, uh, is the, we recover from the disaster at the end of act two. Curtain comes back up, and it's like, how are we going to get through this? And we rally, and we somehow overcome if it's a comedy, we win, and if it's a tragedy, we lose. Um, and that's, that three-act structure, we tend to overlay that, that five-part dramatic structure. It's, it's, I talk about it in terms of, you guys probably hear a little bit of quantum physics. People like to bat physics around. There's light theory, and in light, there's wave theory and particle theory. Light can be a particle or a wave. They're two different theories that both explain light. And they both work, but they're, they're just different theories. So the same here. Five-part dramatic structure is a truth, by and large, and so is three-act structure. They go together. Uh, the inciting incident happens in Act 1. The escalating series of events happens in Act 2. The crisis is the end of Act 2, uh, and the climax is Act 3, and the resolution is in Act 3. And I think we're out of time. So much more we could do. We could talk for a year, but any other hey. questions before we close up? I, I, I think uh, in light of how the structure of the classes work, I think we're, we're there. But gosh, David, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Good evening, man. Thank you, guys. It was a real pleasure. And good luck with your writing and hey, uh, your acting. Good luck with your new script and uh, in the meetings that are coming in the next few days. Well, you know, I, 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 the one thing I'm not counting on is when you get to the president level part, they want us to have it ready for him for Friday, which I'm excited about. But that's the kind of call where you get Monday morning. Uh, well, he got called to France for a reshoot of something or other. So we'll see. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful we'll we'll hear some news on Monday or Tuesday. All right, guys. Absolutely. Yep. Very good. Thank you, David. Well, okay. I'll uh, give you a call a little later on if you're available. I'll, I'll give you a phone call later on. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you so much, guys. Hey guys, uh, Friday for our class. Um, I said Monday. Didn't you